Uh, Michael Josselson was there at the instruction of Frank Wisner. Now, who's Frank Wisner? Well, he ran the Office of Policy Coordination for the CIA. And Josselson was there to monitor the investment. Because the whole hook operation, all, all those sandwiches that they were ordered, those wine bottles, that was all paid for by Frank Wisner's outfit in the CIA. All of it. They paid for all that stuff. They paid for the bridal suite, they paid for all the food, they paid for every, all the mimeographing, all that stuff. It was, you know, thanks to the U.S. government. Um, the press coverage, the way the press coverage came out, well, that's because, you know, Wisner has the resources to contact William Randolph Hearst and say, hey, hey, you want to do something for the country? You know, these communists are they're going to try to come in here. You can do something for the country and William Randolph Hearst, you know, he wants to do some, for, something for the country. So all the press coverage of the Lord conference, name. yeah, it was that it's a commie conference. You know, Wisner can, has con connections to Henry Luce. And, you know, so Luce runs Time Life magazine. So, and also one other thing too, the wall of Astoria, how did they get the room? Dubinsky. David Dubinsky threatened the wall of Astoria. If you don't give us a nice place in this hotel, we're going to go on strike. So the CIA ran, an op ran this operation. Uh, and they were pleased. They thought it was very successful. Uh, and a year afterwards, in West Berlin, uh, June 1950, you had the founding of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And what, what is the Congress for Cultural Freedom? I mean, it's a CIA fund. Um, but what is it? What did they do? What is their objective? Um, well, I mean, what they did aside from having conferences, they published uh, literary journals, cultural journals, artistic journals. And Counter was their, one, of the, one of their flagship journals based in London, uh, edited by uh, Irving Crystal and uh, Stephen Spender. Um, there was also Jeremy uh, Nott, uh, which is their German publication. This existed before the CCF, but they picked it up. Uh, and this was edited by uh, <coughs> Melvin, Melvin Lasky. And Lasky's like Cook. He, he used to be a communist, and he broke from it. All of these ex-communists became virulent anti-communists. Um, and in the words of a um, British participant at the CCF conference, they may have left communism, but they didn't leave dialectical materialism. So, um, another journal they picked up was uh, the Partisan Review. They again had a history before the CCF, but in the 50s, the CIA came in and uh, kept the Partisan Review going. Um, so they put out cultural journals, literary journals. Uh, you know, there was a certain kind of content. But let me just kind of fly through what they did. They had art exhibits. You know, anybody like Mark Rothko? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you don't like that, you know, you can always look at William de Kooning. Um, most of, a lot of what they uh, did with the art exhibits was modern art, abstract expressionism, surrealism, whatever isms existed uh, in that period. Um, it tend to look like Picasso by a five-year-old. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's an attempt to look like Picasso by a five-year-old. <laughs> I thought the castles looked like a fire. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but um, they also had uh, music concerts. Uh, in fact, they had a relationship with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, yeah. where they would uh, bring them to the Boston Symphony Orchestra to Europe and have them tour. But you know, the, the, the idea on the surface was to promote Western freedom. Uh, to promote the idea of free artistic expression. That's, this is the surface level. Um, so, oh, uh, let's get away from off the, the 
two, now, so what's the purpose of all this? Um, if you believe that we are at war with communism, that we are at this, we are in this great big ideological war with communism, and, and people, there are people that believe it, we have to secure the minds of Western Europeans, we have to secure the minds of intellectuals. The target of this, the official target of this CIA operation, called the Congress for Call for Freedom, were intellectuals in Western Europe, but also what was called the non-communist left. The idea being, we cannot allow them to have sympathies with the Soviet Union. We cannot allow them to have communist sympathies. We can't allow them because the Soviets will take advantage. You know, you can extend the thinking, but that's that's the surface level idea. Um, now, what should be noted is that as the CAA was funneling money through through uh, foundations, that's how they did it. They did they had these foundations. Some of them they set up themselves. Some of them already existed, like the Ford Foundation. You know, they can go up to these guys. They can go up to Rockefeller. Hey, you want to do something for the country? And you know, they can put the CIA money in there and the foundation distributes it. But um, uh, what was I getting? At? Oh, um, what was that? That guy just left. Right. Um. <laughs> yeah, but I was I was trying to drive it something. About various foundations. Yeah, that was a digression. A digress from the next level from the superficial level. Yeah, am I ready to do that? Will I done with this? Here, what was happening in Europe? Um, well, the idea is to, well, I, okay, I remember what I was going to get Yeah, in a sense, it's, it's, it's the idea of trying to nudge people. But nudge them away from communism. Or have an outlet for some of these writers and artists to write things, but don't let it get so out of hand that it, that it goes against our foreign policy objectives. There is that level. Um, may I, there's more I want to say. Oh, I, actually, I know what I want to I, I know what I was going to bring up. Um, the people who were, were around it and, and involved in it, who may have not been like a Josselson or a Lasky, because those guys knew the CIA role. A lot of the people around the CCF some of the people writing their articles who were in the Maloud. Did they know or did they not know? They probably did know. And the reason I say that is uh, if, if, if one of these artists, or these writers, was going to take a, a job with one of these journals, and uh, let's say they were at one of these DC cocktail parties, uh, and they were talking to somebody about it, the response would be, oh, why do you want to work for the CIA? That's the kind of conversation that was going on. So it's not like it was a secret. People knew. However, in 1967, Tom Braden, who was a CIA agent and was involved in the CCF operation, he wrote an article in the Saturday Evening Post called, Why I'm Glad the CIA is Immoral. That was a high one. In this article, he decides to blow up the whole CCF operation. He just spilled all the beans. Yes, the CAA, we funded this thing. This is ours. We even put an editor in an encounter. He even said stuff like that. You know, it ruffled some feathers. So they ended up blowing up this operation. Um, I mean, why did they do that? You know, there's, there's reasons for the CAA to blow up their operations. You know, maybe these. Because they had to recruit a lot of these non-communist left people, these intellectuals. And you know, maybe they, were, they wanted to dispense with them. Maybe they weren't any good for them. Who knows? There's, there's all kinds of plausible reasons. Um, it should also be noted that these publications did not have a big, broad circulation. You know, it's not like they were reaching masses of people. That's not what this was for. But they had a very small audience. The concerts had a small audience. The content uh, uh, and the substance of it was directed at a very small audience of intellectuals. So why is that important? I mean, I'm not even going to answer that question. I just want to pose it. Now, 
Beneath the surface is another objective. And I think this is the, this is, well, actually, both of these objectives, I think, intermesh in a certain way. Because when I think of the non communist left and making sure that they don't have Russian sympathies, I think of Bernie Sanders. I think of the way he behaves. Yeah. Hold on, wait, hold on, yeah, just, uh, go on. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I just got lost in one point. What does CCF stand for? Congress for Cultural Freedom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other objective uh, is to promote an aesthetic that actually destroys art. And I'm not actually going to elaborate on that. I'm, just, I'm actually, what I, all I'm going to say here at this point is that a lot of what we consider art is actually the destruction of art because it does not require knowledge in terms of how to generate it. Uh, or in some cases, it destroys the basis for, by which you create an artistic work. And I, I'll have an example of that at the end of the presentation. Um, I think that's the actual real objective. It's, it's part of the broader process of destroying civilization, as you destroy the ability for, for artistic creativity by passing off as art things that are not art. Um, so this is actually. This is actually what we've stepped into as we're born into this culture and into this world. Um, but I'm going to just kind of do a recap of everything. Do it all at once. Um, so, so what did we have in this post-World War II period? You had a reconstitution of the political economic system of empire. You had the retention of the services of, not, of Nazi intelligence agents. I just went through one case. You had the destruction of art, the promotion of its destruction. What interest does this serve? If you're, for example, if you, let's say you are an intelligence agent in the United States and you want to do good for your country. Well, you, you might not think of it this way. But whose interest does it serve? How does, does this serve the public interest? What interest does any of this serve? And again, I'm not answering this, I'm not asking this rhetorically. Um, so, Now, we have to talk a little bit about getting out of this, this paradigm. Because the whole purpose of what I just went through is to give people an idea of the building up of the paradigm, of the architecture of it. It's the paradigm that's collapsing, what the transatlantic nations are suffering through. And we're seeing it get worse and worse. The big thing that's been on people's minds are these mass shootings. Um, so, uh, Friedrich Schiller, um, I'm not going to say a lot about him because I did another presentation where I said a lot about him. So I will refer people to my presentation from last year. Um, but I do, I will say, I will. Um, say a few things about some of the ideas in his letters on the aesthetic education of man. Because he, his idea is that you can't just educate the intellect, you have to educate the emotions. And the, prob and the problem we're facing today in terms of getting <coughs> transatlantic nations to cooperate with the rest of the world, there is a, a need to, in, in, to educate the intellect, but we cannot neglect the emotions. In fact, the emotions are more important. They're a lot more important. Because that's actually where you develop compassion for your fellow man. Uh, Schiller talks about beauty 
not as a romantic idea, but as a species power. So then, the species power means that it's something that has a transformative capability. So you can take something from state A to state B. Uh, you know, gravitation will accelerate an object from one place to another. Beauty will transform and do something to the mind. It's important to understand what that is. And Schiller has an idea. Uh, but to understand it, you, you have to kind of look at the mind a little bit. You have to look at what it does. Because uh, what Schiller says about beauty is it has the power to make man whole. And this is with respect to the idea that we have two faculties of mind. We have what's called the sense faculty, which is associated with feeling, emotion. Uh, it's the receptive quality of mind, where you take in the material of the environment around you, and you allow it to impact you. Uh, you also have the rational faculty. Um, and that's associated with intellect, uh, thought. Uh, asserting your will requires thought and idea. Uh, so with the rational faculty, it, that's what allows you to determine the environment around you. So one is a, is a passive faculty, one is an active faculty. Uh, yet they seem to have contradictory desires. Or if they want to go in different directions. Uh, and so, so what Schiller says is, to be free, to be free means to be fully human, and it means to fully develop all of your faculties. So you're not fully human, and you're not free if your intellect is overly developed, but your emotions are not, and vice versa. So, So, in Schiller's letters, the latter, this is the latter part of his letters, he has an idea of the stages of, of individual uh, development. Uh, and he has this idea of man in his initial state before any bounds or limits or any determination is done to you. Uh, you, are, you have a, a boundless, infinite potential. However, as you begin to interact with the world outside of you, uh, you move into your first determined state of existence. So from all the possibilities, you move into one particular state. Uh, and this is a result of the passive sensual faculty uh, acting on you and determining you. Now, he calls this the, the physical condition. There's another condition he calls the moral condition. And that is associated with the rational faculty and the activation of that faculty. Um, so, how do you go from the physical condition to the moral condition? Because you're dealing with two faculties of mind that are independent and that do things that are opposite. So one is not connected to the other. How do you actually bridge the gap where you go simply from being receptive to thought, to formation of thought that leads you to determine the environment around you? Uh, he says that there is something called the aesthetic condition, which, in a sense, puts your mind, in a sense, back to that initial undetermined state of boundless potential. Uh, and that the aesthetic condition creates, the, not a bridge, but it creates a means by which you can uh, begin to uh, actualize your rational faculty. Um, and so then, through your development as a human being, uh, 
you're, you can exercise your will to move from physical condition to moral condition. Um, and that the aesthetic condition is necessary in order for you to undo whatever previous state or condition you've been in. That's the role of art. And so this, these, are, these ideas that I'm going through here, these are like the, the latter nine letters. Um, but it, it should give people some sense uh, of the importance of, or the purpose of art because art doesn't, doesn't bring you to any truth. It doesn't help you uh, make a discovery. Uh, there's nothing practical about art. Um, but it, it is necessary uh, in order for you to be a fully developed, free human being. So, how much time do we have? We're good? Okay. So now, now that I've gone through that, um, I, I wanted to have a, uh, an artistic, or an aesthetic experience. Um, however, I, I don't... I don't know if it's really useful to subject people to something ugly. Because um, I have taken the time to listen to Arnold Schoenberg, who's an atonal composer, and it's not good for you. It's actually, it's actually not music. It's not. And I have reasons for saying that. Um, let me ask, has anybody ever listened to, the, to atonal music in this room? I don't know. <laughs> no? Maybe. Actually, I do like, I did like, uh, what's his name, Alvin Barrett to some degree, but I haven't heard it for a long time, so I might not think the same now. Sure. I don't okay. like the Schoenberg vocals. Yeah, I don't think I should play it. I think it's <laughs> bad. It's just so bad for people. Um, he's, he's, trying to do, he's trying to just work with the 12-tone roll and do well, whatever he wants to it. Yeah, no, he, he, destroy, he destroys harmony, actually. I mean, you, it's not music if it's not harmonic, it doesn't have a harmonic basis. But actually, let me consult Paul. Do you think it would be bad to play Schoenberg for a minute? No. Okay, all right, I'm going to play, play Schoenberg just a little bit. Please. Yes. Yeah, just a short while. I haven't heard it for a long time. Okay, good. Yeah, it's actually, no, it's good because it's a song, it's two minutes. Um, oh. People should listen to it, and I'm going to play uh, Franz Schubert, so. Okay. Will be rehabilitated by Schubert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Oh, 
that's the end. Well, thank you. Well, because there's no, um, here's what I would, well, because artistic advancement requires knowledge. Yeah. It, uh, craft requires knowledge. The reason I say that, for example, modern, like abstract expressionist painters, like the stuff I was showing, mm -hmm. that doesn't require any craft, really, or technique. Yeah. Now, some, some academic might disagree, but if you consider, for example, uh, the craft and the technique and knowledge that went into a lot of the great Renaissance paintings, there's a, there's a lot of knowledge of the science and optics that goes into producing a lot of the great works of art that we know at that time. Um, however, if you want to paint like, like de Kooning, you don't have to concern yourself with that. Or if you want to paint like a Mark Rothko or Jackson Pollock, you don't really need to worry about that. What, what were they doing? Yeah, like Stuart says, just throwing paint on a wall. That's, that's self-expression. I'm, I'm being creative. But, yeah, but it's, but it's not beautiful. See, there's a, um, if you actually read uh, writings on aesthetics by <coughs> serious thinkers, there is a connection between beauty and nature. And that, is, that comes from the idea that God uh, made nature beautiful. Uh, it's part of his creation. Um, so aesthetic advancement uh, comes from applying our knowledge of the order of the universe to creating artwork. Now, the way that's actually shown in music is, well, actually, this way, just the two pieces I played here. Um, Schoenberg's music is, well, it's not music, but it's also just horrible. It's really just, it's not, to say not pleasant doesn't express how bad it is. And the reason is Schoenberg does not use the basis for his composition, the natural beauty that comes from the harmonic tones. Because the, the musical scales have a, a harmonic basis. And there's more to it than that, but, but that is the basis for it, is to create, is to use the tones that are pleasing to the ear. Now, you're not solely using those, but that, that is a basis to define beautiful composition and beautiful music. So when I play, when I play the Schubert, that has that basis, and so it's beautiful. There's some other things you asked. Yeah, the only thing I get out is like you look at the modern world, the urban world, like you see like how do you call it? Like, heavy metal music. Yeah. You know? Okay. So you look at me, I don't know how you would get somebody. You you asked if, if music can be used as a weapon or yeah. aesthetic can be used as a weapon? Yes. Okay. It has been. So is this from this because when you come to the idea of like, oh the universe holographic, we're all vibration and all these. And then you have the music where I disagree with those people. I disagree with the people that say we're just vibrations. I know what you're getting at. I don't think they're right. Um, but no, it actually has been used as a weapon. Uh, read, have you read uh, Impact of Science and Society by Bertrand Russell? No, I wouldn't say I came across it. It's a book we No, we, uh, we, it's a book our organization references a lot. Uh, it's a, actually, it, it was a set of lectures he gave at UCLA, and they made a book on it. What's it called? 
the impact of science and society. And uh, he actually talks about how the uh, future, this is 1954, around that period, same period as my presentation. Um, he talks about uh, how the future of science will be mind control, psychological science, however he expresses it. Uh, and he, he talked about the idea of being able to create the conviction in people that snow is black. Yeah, 1984 kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. See, he's not, he's, yeah, but he, he's somebody that's privy uh, to what's being worked upon. Another person who's privy to this stuff was uh, Aldous Huxley. Um, but one of the things he says is that one thing that researchers are finding very effective are um, uh, verses set to, to music, or verses in tone to music are very useful in controlling how people think. Uh, and so if you look at what we call music today, modern music, modern popular music, it's very percussive, uh, it's very chanty, uh, there's no development in it, and it, it, has, it does have a hypnotizing effect. Or, you know, look at people like these, these uh, dance clubs or concert, concerts where you, know, you have these mosh pits and stuff like that. It's like a, Dian it's, it's like a Dionysic orgy. You know, people go, go to these things and they go out of their minds. And to say that music has nothing to do with that is, is just irrational because people go to listen to this music to do these kinds of activities. So it's all one. It's all like one big cult ritual. So no, it is a weapon. And it has been used to make our society very irrational. I've seen, like, I came from a background of, um, I see music, music, a culture where people are happy, dancing. I see the music, music, the war songs, people are galvanized by it. Mm. Um, okay. You know, they, otherwise you would not get them to, I mean, things of music get somebody to a certain state of thinking, or, uh, yeah, I don't know, you get like alcohol, I don't know what it is, um, that gets the people to get to certain, um, vibration or a certain way of thinking. Like, I, I, somebody would be sitting just quietly in board and anything on the side and play the music or one song and they get into action. Mm. You know? Hey, right. Yeah. Hey, right. Yeah. 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 Actually, it's, it's good you bring this up because, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think art in general can have... Scott's tribes. Art can have a variety of effects. But is it is it gonna? But how do you actually create what Schiller talks about in terms of the aesthetic condition? Because he talks about the aesthetic condition as necessary for furthering the development of the, of the faculty of the mind and furthering your development as a human being. To create the aesthetic condition, art has to be beautiful. Ancient beats or yeah, statue or something, something beauty in nature. Well yeah, well, yeah, actually, there's, there's an example of the progression of, of, the, uh, of sculpture. I was actually going to try to use that as, a, as, a, as an example. I just couldn't incorporate it. I didn't have enough time to incorporate that. But yeah. Oh, yeah, sir. Remember, the goal is here, she didn't fit either, either part of the spectrum or the third leg prints in part. Dr. Did you see Mr. Hitz? Um, you were sort of broke the mold of the Romantic period. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, see, if, if you stay with Schubert, you essentially stay in the Romantic, romantic period. No, I don't I don't agree with And uh, there's some, I mean, what's your opinion of Bartok? I don't have an opinion of Bartok. But I, don't, I also don't consider Schubert romantic. I don't consider, I, I think that um, the idea of the, Defining music by like periods, I don't think is the right thing to do. Because I'm mean, okay, but it was it was, a, it was a breakup from what had been before. Well, it has to give, give the same. Well, I can, um, it's easier for me to talk about it with people like Schumann, with Brahms, uh, because they're considered romantic. But well, in fact, yeah, I mean, they're past that period to some degree. But well, it's a different animal. Yeah, but they aren't romantic. Right. They're, they're classical. They're of the same tradition of, as Bach and as Mozart. 
I did. Um, and in fact, they had fights around this. They actually had public fights against people like Lyft. Uh, uh, and their beef with Lyft was that uh, his music had one intention, which is to titillate the audience. Uh, what about Chopin? Um, I think Chopin, I would put him in, I actually consider him to be classical. I've listened to him. Um, I think he's of that tradition. He was very much influenced by Bach, but a lot of these guys, okay. yeah, they all pay tribute to Bach. Um, I think he's closer to that to the classical. I'm not really quite sure what he's doing, but it doesn't it doesn't strike. Some you can play it romantic, but I think if you play it romantic, you don't understand. Playing Gould actually uh, tried to break that mold to stop playing romantic. But people call it romantic music in the romantic mode. It's quite a game in some ways. I, I have not heard of that. Fred Gould is uh, our big, most famous pianist. No, I know who he is. Um, I just never heard anybody say that about him. Well, there's a uh, question on a friend of mine who's a musician. You know, so. Okay, yes. Uh, in, in respect to the, the Schubert music that you played for us, do you understand the words? Of that piece? Uh, for the most part. I'm actually working on that piece. The reason I'm asking is that the words, because of course it wasn't. Could, hold up, could you hold on one second? Let me go get back to the music. Hold on. It's really about art in general. Yeah, but, but it's not that important what the words mean um, to me at this point. But it just seemed as if anybody who heard that music and understood the words mm -hmm. would get a lot more out of the music than somebody who does not understand German and did not know the meaning of those words. Yeah. Um, it, it's the same as opera, and you get hugely more out of it. If you've studied the libretto, even if you don't know Italian or French uh, or German or Russian, um, so I was just wondering if you knew the meaning of those words because I, I felt I was only getting a portion of the beauty of that music because I didn't know the words. No, I think you're right because um, that again I'm working on this, so I've had, I've had to go through all the lyrics and go through the words. I, mean, I don't have it solidly in my head, but I do have a general, I, I do have an idea of what's being talked about. But I, no, I think you're right. You can still enjoy it though, even not knowing the words. But no, I, yeah, I agree. Kevin, <clears throat> how would we know the difference between a piece that was classical versus romantic by how it moves you, or whether it moves you? <laughs> uh, I think you'll be moved. Well, you can not. You can also not be moved because it. Uh, it yeah, no, it's true. You can not be moved by anything. That's true. But uh, the classical moves you in a specific way, which I can't put into words. Um, romantic moves you in a certain way. But you can also get an idea of what the composer is trying to do. Uh, I mean, I like to use this because it's pretty obvious what he's trying to do. He's trying to show you if you listen to his music. Um, you don't get that with classical. They actually are trying to get at the higher faculty of mind. Yeah, it does move you in that way. So could you say one is trying to invoke an emotion or a, or a feeling and the other is, is appealing to the mind and, and moving, you know? I mean, I just think there's a, there's a uh, with classical there's a more noble intent. An acknowledgement of you as a creative human being. So I just say you have to, you have to listen and and, and 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 look into how it's affecting you. I think you'll you'll see the difference. Um, yeah. Well, if I, if I could just add to that because I, I think that's true. Um, but part of it is. Um, 
there is there is a technical aspect to it, but it's not in it's not in the notes. It's not in order per se alone. There is um, a movement from um, from beginning to end, and I don't think that we could properly answer your question with a, an actual song here. Mm. But I, but there is, because you're asking more of a technical question, right? Okay. Because the reason I have a problem with that answer is like how, it, and I do, sorry Charles, uh, how it moves you is because this is the line that we get from the, for lack of a better word, <coughs> cultural freedom, right? And this is, this is, the line that uh, our popular culture feeds us right now is this, you know, behind the you know, no, movie. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll defend what I say. Okay. No, classical music does move you in a different way right. than romantic music. Right. I think Brahms made it, was it, it might have been Brahms, but somebody, one of the classical uh, musicians was a lot more crude about it. Uh, I can't quote him because I don't remember, but he says that this moves you below the waist. <laughs> so I will defend what I say, but I say it's okay. true. No, no, it, that's it, good. It, I'm just I'm looking for a more, I guess, uh, specific answer. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. It's just, you have to talk about it. Yeah. And then you have to let something fly out of your mouth. <laughs> Would you say yeah. that romantic music seems to me has been the rise of this whole notion of celebrity uh, in, okay, let's just say music, that the division, the division between performer and audience. You know, I, what I would rather do than answer that question, I think there's a good pedagogical example that anybody can do. Actually, I wish I didn't turn off this computer so I could just play it. Um, Ave Maria. Listen to Schubert's Ave Maria. I mean, everybody's heard of Ave Maria by Schubert. And then listen to, to Franz Liszt, Ave Maria. Mm. Think about the subject matter. What are we? What, what, are, what, what is that song about? And who's actually, for lack of a better word, who's actually doing honor to the idea? Because if you listen to Liszt, it becomes, it's very clear, he's kind of, Trivializing it. I should. I wish I didn't turn this computer off because I would play it right now. Well, it doesn't take long. Really? Mm -hmm. Let me turn it back on. Well, all the computer and. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Plus, I mean, how much time do we have? This well, so yeah. Start. Actually, we should probably. Like, yeah. Start moving. Well, we think there was a what question. You had that list of things that were involved in this sub. The subsurface objective is the CF and the CCF and so on. You were talking about the reconstitution of political economic systems, the empire, mm -hmm. the retention and asking intelligence agents. What was the third item? Uh, just the promotion of 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 a uh, depraved culture. I, that's not what I what it said. But it's cultural destruction. Yeah, the destruction of culture. In the end, that's what it comes to. Of art. Yeah. Just one last question. Sure. Uh, yeah, forgot me. Sure. Uh, we're saying that does the language make a difference if you don't know the language of that music? Would it make a, like would it make, uh, make a difference in understanding what the music is saying? Or like you can pretty much glamorize anything, like poem, for example. You can write a poem on anything and romanticize it. I agree. No, I think you're right. I, uh, I think people romanticize Chopin. Um, but they romanticize Beethoven and how they play it. I think you're right. But then they don't really, they're, 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 uh, they're not getting at, I guess the idea is getting inside the mind of somebody. I have more of an experience with Socrates in terms of trying to recreate his thinking than with uh, any of the composers. So I have to use that analogy. Um, but their minds are laid bare for us because they have letters, they have writings. You get a sense of who, how these people thought. And that, that's to somehow be in the, be in the performance of the piece. So 
Okay, we should. I just have a recommendation that we should.